Alright, so in the last lesson I kind of left off with Jude, um, and I'm not going to, I know it says there Acts Jude, this because I, I um, reworked the lesson, but I'm not going to go back to it. Um, but I, I did say one thing in Jude that I wanted to clear up. Um, when it's talking about Moses, uh, Moses' body and Michael and um, Lucifer arguing over it, um, I kind of gave a little bit of, um, I, I said it wrong, okay? Um, So it, it, supposedly this is from um, th this story is is called the um, the assumption of Moses, and it was supposed to have been at the end of um, the testament of Mo Moses, but it was not preserved, um, and it's part of the pseudepigrapha. So just to kind of give clarification there. Um, some people have inev inevitably asked, so does that make it scripture? Not necessarily. Um, it seems like he's just quoting something from, um, from, well, from what he would have known, you know. Um, in sermons nowadays, we may quote things from movies or songs or whatnot. That doesn't mean that we're calling those things inspired. Um, so, um, um, this online class is actually a um, dry run for when I do it when I start the class uh, next week um, on the 12th. Uh, so if it seems a little bit like I'm testing stuff out, it's because I am. <laughs> so that takes us to the book of Hebrews. Um, many people have have suggested many different authors, but what's important to take home at the end of the day is we don't know who wrote it. Um, as far as the audience, it seems most likely that it's largely, if not mostly, Jewish Christian, um, Jewish Christians, uh, that maybe some of them came from a sect background, like the Essenes, for instance. Um, possible. Once again, not sure. We, we know that they're more than likely mostly Jews, uh, Jewish Christians, um, but uh, beyond that, it's mostly speculation. Um, and it seems most likely that they are um, in-house churches of Rome. Once again, seems most likely. Um, not necessarily that um, with Hebrews, you really can't push things too far. <laughs> it's a little hard to understand um, the specifics because we're not given the specifics. Um, and we'll see part of that is because it's more of a sermon than an epistle. Um, well, anyways, it was written in the 60s, um, sometime probably. Uh, probably before the destruction of Jerusalem, or as that would have made an excellent point for him, for the... Um, Shakeable kingdom and whatnot. And they mention this later on in the in the sermon, epistle, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the context is: in light of persecution, some are wanting to revert to Jewish practices for safety and habit. Okay. So basically, there's this there's just this um, temptation for these um, Jewish Christians to to either go through the motions of Judaism to you know um, because they're used to it or because they're being persecuted or whatever or um, um, to to revert back to Judaism out of out of just being tired of being a Christian with the persecution that it came with. Now remember, um, early Christianity was seen as um, they didn't see themselves as different than the Jews at first, and as they developed, they slowly started to become separate. But then also, don't forget that the um, that uh, Emperor Nero started persecuting um, the Christians in Rome in about 64, so that may be a factor as well. And that would mean that they were facing persecution from Rome and the Jews, and it also would have meant that they would have already been kicked out of their homes once um, in the 40s um, for being, you know, the Jewish squabble or whatever, and all the Jews were kicked out. So um, that those may be factors. Um, so um, it, it's not really an epistle. It doesn't have any of the you know regular uh, marks that we were so used to with the other epistles, so it's it's hard to it's hard to really know what it is for sure, um, and it doesn't close with your your regular thing you know where it, we don't even know who wrote the thing, you know it really doesn't give much. Um, it gives a very vague definition of who it's talking about for the audience, um, so. <clears throat> 
So also, uh, it mentions Melchizedek. This is a character from the Old Testament, a, a priest king from the Old Testament who Abraham paid tithes to. Um, and uh, it's important that we don't press this analogy too far, but that we don't see it too short. Uh, but understand that Melchizedek was, was mostly well known to the Jewish communities, more than likely. Um, and that Hebrews lean strongly on a knowledge of the Pentateuch. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Lean strongly on that. So if you've never read Genesis through Deuteronomy, there's a good chance you're not going to understand the book of Hebrews. Um, as it talks about Jesus being the great high priest. It talks about him being the, um, being the, the, the final sacrifice that's good for all time and for all sin. Um, um, so yeah. Um, the main theme, if I could pick one, would be keep your focus on Christ. Yes, you are going to have struggles. Yes, this and this is going to happen. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to want to go to tradition over over um, commands. It's just a natural um, natural temptation. Um, but through it all, keep your focus on Christ. Just keep focusing on Christ. Oh, but I messed up again today. Keep focusing on Christ. So just a few things. In chapter 1, 1 through 2, it says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in, his, in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Um, now, uh, once again, I kind of mentioned this very vaguely in the Old Testament class. Um, in the Old Testament, was considered to be written by prophets, as in all of the writers of the Old Testament are considered to be prophets. So when he says, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, he's not just talking about who we think of as the prophets, you know, Daniel, Ezekiel, Malachi, Micah, all these ones. He's talking about the books of Kings, the books of Chronicles, Esther, Nehemiah, um, uh, Genesis, uh, Ruth. I mean, you go down the list, he, Psalms, he's talking about the whole Old Testament. Okay, uh, That's why he says, in many times and in, many, and in various ways. Um, so he's talking about the entire Old Testament. Uh, Jewish, if you understand the Old Testament in Jewish eyes, it's a lot easier to see where things are, how things are being said in the New Testament, because once again, they saw themselves as as Jews, okay, or as a continuation of the faith, I should say, um, not necessarily Jews. As obviously by 57, you know, Paul's talking about the difference between them. So obviously by that time it had been established, but you know, and probably in the 30s, maybe even into the 40s. Um, they thought of themselves as, you know, we are continuing the faith. Um, so in 4, 12 through 13, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Um, so the, the, the moral of the story here that he's saying, is that Jesus sees the real you, not just the things you do. He sees the heart. You know, I think that is important because he's talking about, let us make every effort to enter that rest that no one will, will perish by following their examples of disobedience. Oh, but I keep on messing up, but I keep on messing up. Jesus sees what's inside. Am I saying that sin is okay? No. But I am saying that when you are struggling against the flesh, God sees your heart rather than when you are living boldly in the flesh where God sees your heart. See, two people can do the exact same thing and one be justified and one not be justified. And the reason for that is because God sees the inside man, whereas man sees the outside man. Okay? Um, I know this has often been, um, been erroneously applied to the Bible, which, I mean, I guess it could apply to the Bible, but in the context, it's talking about Jesus, the Word, who is able to, to sift through us. And so chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God uh, and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away, to be brought back to repentance, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him in public disgrace. So there's a few things um, to notice. Um, first off, it seems likely that he's saying it is impossible for you to bring them back because the one thing that... that causes that salvation, Jesus, they are actually neglecting. See, a lot of times people try to attach this to the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but that's a completely different 
thing. Okay, I know FF Bruce made this really popular, but there's no reason to connect that with this. Um, and, you know, and then it all, it's also important to note that even if you don't agree with, with my take on it that I just said, um, as George Guthrie once once mentioned, I think it was, yeah, George Guthrie once once mentioned, this is only while they're continuing in that in that action. Only while they're continuing in that action. In other words, this is not saying that for those who apostatize, they will never be brought back to salvation. That's not what he's saying at all. Or that they never can be brought back to salvation. I have known many people who have abandoned the faith and come back. Um, and, you know, really, if you try to push that too far, you just get caught up in dogma and not so much in fact. And I'm not interested in dogma. I'm in interested in fact. And the fact is that um, while you are um, uh, living in your sin, living, doing your own way, um, you give away your salvation. Which, once again, disobedience causes disbelief. The more we disobey God, the more we come to a place of apathy towards God, and we eventually fall to a place of disbelieving God. Okay, um, so this is this should only be seen as while they continue in their sin. Basically, Hebrews should be a motivation for you to leave the things of the world behind and focus on Christ. Okay, it's not meant to scare you. It's not meant to. Um, well, yeah, it is meant to scare you. It's meant to scare you out of sin. Okay, um, it's, it's not meant to uh, make you guilt trip yourself and 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 second guess your salvation. You shouldn't take one vague part of scripture and say that this is absolutely what it means, even though it's not affirmed anywhere else in the scripture. Okay, just consider that. Even the examples that he used, um, he he always hints towards um, that final. Um, decision. See, he says, but the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. In other words, if it continues its action. Okay? Not so much right now. That's why he says, today, if you hear, hear um, the Holy Spirit, turn from your sin. Once again, just not trying to get too much into theology here, just take it in stride. It's saying you should, if you are a Christian, turn from your sin. Don't live in your sin. Um, obviously, it's saying it's, in, it's saying, it, saying it in very harsh ways to, to encourage you to out of that. But 7:14 uh, through 17 says, um, "For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And um, what we have said is even more clear if another priest is like priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an industrial indestructible life." Um, for it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Um, basically what this means is Jesus is a priest, and his blood covers all sin for all time. Okay. Um, yes, in one or two passages it mentions us as, as priests, but obviously the Mormons have taken this way too far. And the order of Melchizedek is, is just pretty much an analogy for us to understand that Jesus is the great high priest, and the only priest who is the authority over the church, as Colossians also shows us. Um, I guess I'm not going to be able to get too much into this, but um, it says that Melchizedek, um, the order of Melchizedek, undoes the order of Aaron. Okay, um, It makes Aaron's obsolete. Um, and once again, it mentions that Jesus will be that high priest for forever, so we don't need people to do it. Okay, um, Kind of read all of the passages, not just some of it. Um, so that takes us to Philemon. Um, some people... Um, you know, have a little bit of problems with um, the pronunciation here. Um, as as far as my understanding, um, it's Philemon. Um, I, I could be wrong. I could go back and check it in the Greek, but it, it, um, the the phi, the iota, um, Philemon. Yeah, I think that's the correct pronunciation, and a lot of people get caught up on that. Not that it really matters, anyways. Um, you want to say Philemon? I don't care. Um, where am I going here? <laughs> I am keep going past this. There we go. <laughs> okay, so that takes us to the book of Philemon, written by Paul. Um, 
some sometimes there's people who try to argue the point against Paul being the author of some of these. It's not really important, and it's also not um, they don't have that much proof behind it. You know, they bring up one small good point, but then if you look at all the details, there's no real reason to believe that um, Paul didn't write these um, epistles. Um, and we'll talk about first and second Timothy when we get there. Um, audience. Uh, it, it, with with Philemon, it's a specific house church in Colossae, not necessarily the whole church of Colossae. Um, so Philemon's house church. Um, it was written about 61, the same time as um, um, the two others, uh, Colossians and Ephesians. Um, we're not going to look at Ephesians in this lesson, just Colossians. Um, so the context is Paul imprisoned in Rome finds Onesimus, uh, Philemon's runaway slave, and converts him. There are some other uh, views that have been um, hypothesized, but I'm not really going to touch them because they, they all have glaring loopholes. Um, some special characteristics. Um, Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians, it seems, were all written at the same time and sent through Tychicus uh, from Rome. Um, who went to Colossae to deliver Philemon and Colossians and Ephesians, maybe laid a sea area for Ephesians. Um, also, I know some people get really upset with the whole slavery aspect in, in Philemon. Um, it's important to note that slavery was not like our modern idea of slavery, okay? There was, as far as racism, it wasn't a, so much about racism. Now, it's about racism. Then, not so much. Um, also, people often sold themselves into slavery at the time, uh, so it was a way of paying off your debts. Um, also, um, it was usually um, the people who were conquered who were slaves. So, um, just on a few little things about like that, like that. I mean, today it's like, oh, well, we all have freedoms and everything. You have to understand it in its context. Um, and Paul wasn't so much condoning or condemning the society so much as saying what should happen within the church. Um, laying the groundworks, if you will, for a later um, anti-slave movement. Um, so the main theme is overlooking offenses. Um, I know some people would say the main theme seems to be slavery, but that doesn't really seem to be the main, the main theme. The main theme seems to be overlooking offenses, and I hope you see that throughout the epistle. Uh, verse 14 um, says... But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor... Um, so any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Um, basically, uh, one thing that we can we can draw from Philemon is being generous past convenience, um, past what you um, what you want in vengeance, um, past that being generous. Then um, verse sixteen, no longer is a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Uh, showing um, that we should be thinking highly of other believers. See, when he was not a believer, um, you know, his name was was you know basically it was okay for him to be seen as as worthless. Now I shouldn't say it like that. Um, not that it was okay for him to be seen as worthless, but um, he was kind of despised, if you will. Okay, um, maybe he did some wrong things or whatever. Uh, but as as a brother, regardless of how he was seen before, that's what I meant to say. Regardless of what he's what, how he was seen before, he should be seen as um, useful. Which actually his name means useful. So, um, in verse eighteen, um, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. We see Paul standing in the gap uh, for the restoration of of um, So that takes us to Colossians. Um, the author, there's no reason to believe in, in, in Colossians being written by anyone else by Paul. Um, yes, it does have a different writing style, and he may have even used an amanuensis, which, once again, is someone who would uh, write it for someone, smooth it over for them, you know. Um, with that being said, there's no reason to doubt it. If you look at all the information, it's, it's very clear um, that, that it um, could just as well be Paul, if, if not, you know, rather than someone else. And there's actually more than sufficient data to say that it was Paul. Um, the audience is the entire church of Colossae, whereas Philemon was written to only a house church. Um, the date is probably around 61, at the same time as Philemon. In the context, the church of Colossae is in danger of syncretistic, Judaizing, and Hellenistic her uh, heresies. Um, there are very strong Jewish elements and very strong Greek elements, and it seems like the church is kind of caught in the middle with trying to be syncretistic, trying to just welcome it all in. Um, 
some special characteristics is Paul did not found this church. This is the second epistle that he's written to a church that he did not found. The first was Romans, this one, then this one. Um, it has a lot of similar content with Ephesians, um, but... Uh, well, some of the reasons why why it wouldn't make sense for Colossians to be written by someone else. Colossae wasn't really a place that was anywhere worth noting. And as you can see there, Colossae, Colossae was destroyed in 61-62 by an earthquake. Um, so, I mean, why would they have picked this place? I mean, it was very obscure. Um, and then if they were going to... It just doesn't make sense. Um the, with with all the stuff, um, I could get more into it, but I'm not going to. This is just is supposed to be a real simple class. Um, um, but anyways, uh, Colossae was destroyed shortly after Paul wrote the letter. Um, so um, I'm not really going to get too much into uh, the different beliefs and whatnot. Um, the, the, if you read through Colossians, he gives reference of the different things. Um, um, he talks about um, the different festivals. He talks about circumcision. He talks about um, um, living immorally. He types out all kind of, all kinds of different stuff. Um, I think from Pentecost, excuse me, from Pentecost to Patmos by Craig Blomberg kind of really summarizes it perfectly fine. Um, so this seems to be the Colossian heresy: Christ not being fully God. Um, would mean Christians are not fully saved, which means they must add works, which means they needed to do the rituals for maturity. Okay, Christ not being fully human would mean Christ Christians not fully saved, which would mean the, um, the only only the spirit is saved, not the body. Um, in other words, we're saved inside, and our body doesn't really matter, so you can do whatever you want. Um, and once again, you can see that syncretism on on both extremes, and Paul is just giving a really good um, basis for um, for Christianity. Um, so the main theme is Christ is fully God. He is God over the church. He's Christ over the world. Um, he's Christ over everything. Um, he is God. Um, in verse in chapter one, verses fifteen to nineteen, this is one of Jehovah's Witness favorite verses to take out of context. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. A few things. First, I, first off, he's not saying all people are saved. Yet it had you have to go through the blood. Just said that at the very end. Uh, second off, um, all the all his fullness dwell in him. Okay. In other words, he was completely God. Um, and then also, um, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Um, obviously, pointing to the fact that he was not created. See what Jehovah's Witness do is they take that first verse and they, verse and they stop there. What he's talking about is in rank. He is preeminent. He is the firstborn. He has the rank, the authority, if you will. Um, and then down here, um, firstborn from among the dead. Yes, because he was the first to be resurrected. So, um, to chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. It's important to know that he's not saying to reject the study of, of other philosophies and whatnot. He's just simply saying don't adopt worldly thinking. Don't take it in. Okay? Um, chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. Um, the reality, however, is found in Christ. Um, these things point to Christ. They've already been fulfilled. We don't need to partake of the Passover anymore. We don't need to partake of all those all those rituals or anything. We are saved by grace through faith. Not by works that no one can brag. Um, so know why you do the things that you do, religiously speaking. Um, or non-religiously speaking. I mean, just know why you do things. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart, 
hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Um, so there, the, the reason, that's what I would call the reason for holiness. Um, since you have been raised with Christ, um, you know, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Basically, you owe it to God. Um, so, 311. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Um, so what he's saying here, I know people get really caught off with this, um, Christ is all and is in all. Obviously, Christ isn't like this book. It's not what he's saying at all. Okay, um, Christ is sovereign is what he's saying and binds us together. Um, once again, don't don't ostracize a verse from its context. 2.19, they have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. So all he's saying is that Christ is sovereign. So um, this lesson's a little bit shorter uh, because it was supposed to have action Jude as part of it. Um, so, anyways, if you have any questions, post them below. Next, next lesson is on Ephesians and Philippians and Titus, First Timothy, and First Peter. So, I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll pick up next time.